Hello, everyone that's waiting. We will be starting the webinar promptly at 11.03. Just giving everyone a heads up, it will be starting the webinar at 11.03. Thank you. Hello, everyone waiting. We'll be starting the webinar at 11.03 Eastern. A couple more seconds here before we get started. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Demystifying Essential Documents in the Era of IC8, GCP, R2. My name is Isaiah Howard, and I'm the Director of Marketing for LMK Clinical Research Consulting. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's webinar. The webinar is being recorded, and the bottom of the actual pane there is a download section where you can download the handout and it will contain today's slides. You should be listening and using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions in the question box. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation we will collect these and address them during the Q&A session. I would now like to introduce Daniel O'Connor, President and Co-Founder of Invona Commerce, and Shole Akdaivan, President and CEO of Alan Kay Clinical Research Consulting. Great, thank you very much, Isaiah. Um, we appreciate everyone taking the time to join us today. And good morning or afternoon, depending on your location in the world. This is Sholay Ekdivan, as Isaiah mentioned. I am the president and CEO of LMK Clinical Research Consulting. I have um, over 20 years of experience in the industry, uh, mostly within clinical operations. And in the past 10 years, been, I have been completely dedicated to all things, file management, TMF, ISF, inspection readiness, all that good stuff. Um, I'm one of the TMF reference models uh, subject matter experts. I have led several uh, subgroups for the TMF reference model, and I continue to be very active in that group. I'm also the lead for the Metrics Champion Consortium's newly uh, found initiative for TMF metrics. 
measuring CMS health and making sure that companies are always inspection ready. And I'm also the newly found, or the, the lead of the newly formed MAGI Investigator Site File Reference Group. And um, this group, we've come together, many sites, um, some vendors, some consultants, and some pharma biotech companies. Our goal is to create a reference model just for sites. So it's very exciting. I'm, I'm very uh, excited to work on this initiative. And now I'd like to introduce my co-presenter, Daniel. I'll turn it over to you. Hello, uh, thank you, Sholay. My name is Daniel O'Connor, and uh, I am uh, honored to be presenting here today to this group. I've got over 20 uh, years of experience developing and commercializing software products in the regulatory and compliance arenas. Uh, been uh, extensively involved with uh, essential document exchange, study startup document management, uh, patient recruitment um, processes in the industry from, and in addition to that, been focusing on regulatory document management, uh, cl clinical and investigator portal technology, and bridging the gap between the uh, ETMF and the EISF, uh, background in law, and in fact, uh, <clears throat> during law school studied administrative law, including FDA, which initially prompted my interest in this field. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Very excited to have you with us today. Thank you. So um, a little bit about LMK for everyone on the line, it, just in case you don't know who we are. We are a global trial master file functional service provider, and we're known in the life sciences industry as a trusted leader for our dedication, our quality solutions, and expert services, and trial master file consulting and services. We are based in Huntersville, North Carolina, a city that you probably have never, ever heard of. It's right outside of Charlotte. Um, we were founded five years ago, um, celebrating our half-decade anniversary. Very exciting. We are ETMF agnostic, so we do not have an actual TMF technology, but we focus on people and process. All of our employees are TMF University certified. TMF University is our um, very unique TMF training uh, service offering. We have 18 TMF training courses. Believe it or not, there are uh, 18 different topics that we talk about. Um, and all of our employees are certified. They've all taken the training and they had to uh, take a very hard test to become TMF University certified. We're the only TMF company that certified women owned. Very proud of that. So, Daniel, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, thank you, Shole. So, I'm one of the co-founders of Innovo Commerce, which was formed in 2009 to solve uh, critical challenges around essential document management from uh, an exchange, from sponsor to site, sponsor to CRO to site, uh, bringing together uh, efficiencies, compliance, oversight, control, to make sure that uh, global clinical trials can be run in an efficient and compliant manner. Uh, founders of, of Innovo Commerce have been uh, extensively involved with uh, e-clinical technologies, including the uh, RELSIS Argus Safety product, which is now part of Oracle, uh, First Doc, First Point, which are uh, well-known regulatory document management systems, which uh, I was involved with. So we bring a wealth of experience and we've uh, built, which we will discuss later, a leading investigator portal technology that has a essential document exchange engine that ensures compliance and efficiency during active site activation study startup through study closeout. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Daniel. So we have a very full agenda for everyone today. We are going to dig very deep into ICH GCP release two and how that impacts the essential documents for the clinical trial. And um, I think we've heard a lot about ICH GCP release two as it relates to risk-based monitoring, but there isn't a lot of talk really about how ICH GCP release two impacts 
the TMF, and the ISF. So we're going to dig into that today, and we really want this to be an interactive webinar. So we do have some polls, and we highly enc we encourage you to uh, participate in the polls. We encourage you to ask questions. You can ask questions throughout the webinar. As Isaiah said, type your question into the question pane, and we will address those during the Q&A section. Um, so our agenda for today is we're going to talk about the current regulatory trends. It is really a very dynamic regulatory environment right now. We have not seen the type of changes in terms of regulation in a very, very long time. So there's a lot happening. It's very important for all of us to be aware of what's happening um, because it's not good enough to say, well, I didn't know that that was a regulation. I didn't know that that was a law. I didn't know that I had to do that. Um, so it's very important for sponsors, CROs, sites, um, consultants, vendors, all of us to understand what those regulations are and follow them accordingly. Then we're going to take a look at the essential documents portion of ICH GCP release 2 and why you should care. Uh, we're going to look at some real findings, some real um, regulatory findings, and how those relate to ICH GCP release 2. We're going to look at ETMF technology and how the implementation has impacted the landscape of the TMF, updates, trends that we're starting to see across the industry, and then some challenges. Um, ETMFs have made, personally, my life very easy, um, but it can also bring some challenges along with it. Then we're going to dive into the regulatory document life cycle. And what does that look like? And what are some of the challenges that sponsors, CROs, and sites are facing with the document life cycle? Then we'll look at regulatory packs, so green light packs or um, I, um, investigator initiation packets. This is kind of the wild west of study startup. And if you have ever worked on study startup, you know what a burden it can be to distribute those packs and also get those uh, completed documents back from the site. So we're going to take a look at that. And then Daniel and I have put together a call to action for each one of you. What are some of the things that you can do right now to ensure that you're compliant with ICH GCP release 2? And how can you address some of the challenges that you may be facing right now as a result of the document life cycle and what you may be experiencing with study startup? So let's get started. Let's start with a poll question. And um, this is one of my favorite poll questions that we have for today. So I'm going to launch the poll. The poll is currently launched. If you wouldn't mind taking just a moment to uh, vote. So I have read ICH GCP release 2 in its entirety. Uh, yes or no, or not sure. So we'll give everyone just a few minutes. I can see most people have voted. Okay, I still see some people still voting, so I'll give you another couple seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Oh, it's very interesting. Okay, so it's about 50-50. So half of you have read R2 in its entirety. Half of you, about half of you have not, and then some are not sure. So I'm assuming the people that have read it in its entirety, you did that one night when you couldn't sleep. Um, because that's really <laughs> the only way to get through it. It's, it's a, it. So R2 is very interesting in terms of what it's telling us, um, what we have to comply with. And I think just kind of generally speaking, in my opinion, what I got out of it is it's ICH catching up to what we are already doing. So for example, monitoring plans, computer validation, certified copy, um, but now that that has happened and they're kind of catching up to what we're already doing or what we should be doing, now we have to do it, right? So that's kind of what I want everyone to keep in the back of their minds. So let's look at some of the current regulatory trends and, and let's start with the changes. 
So as I mentioned earlier, we have not seen this many changes in regulation in quite some time. So it can be a burden on those of us that are impacted by these regulations because we have to know, number one, what those regulations are, and number two, how to implement them. So the first and most significant is ICHG CP Release 2. And there are different sections of um, the, the addendum, and it impacts just about every aspect of the clinical trial from start to finish. Uh, 21 CFR Part 11 is being updated. Um, hopefully everyone knew that. Um, and there are some significant changes in the, uh, well, it's actually a revision, in the revision as well. Um, and a lot of it will definitely impact ETMF. It's going to impact EISF. So it's really going to impact the landscape of our TMF. The EMA guideline on GCP compliance in relation to TMF, we're going to talk about that um, in just a moment, well, later on in the webinar, rather. Um, that guideline is it's a very uh, powerful. Um, it has a lot of information, a lot of very good information. It definitely errs on the side of um, being very conservative. So even if you're not uh, running a clinical trial or conducting a clinical trial in the EU, um, it's definitely a very good guideline to follow. Um, definitely a very good guideline to read if you, again, have a sleepless night, you can't fall asleep, something to read and understand. It, it, it talks a lot about what the EMA expects in terms of the TMF, and they're very, very detailed. They're very explicit about what they expect from sponsors, CROs, and sites. So it's, it's a very good um, guideline. Um, GDPR. So much buzz about the general data protection regulation because we're about 22 days from that becoming um, law. Um, and that is going to impact all of us across the board. Um, so it's very important as an organization that you understand GDPR and how it relates to your organization, what information that you're collecting from sites, what information you're collecting from your subjects, what information you're collecting from your vendors, and how to protect that information. Um, I was actually watching the news a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying how even Facebook, social media, is going to have to change because of GDPR. So that's how widespread and important uh, that particular regulation is. So. Some current regulatory trends, it, you know, you would kind of think that as we implement ETMFs and as we become better with TMFs, we would start to see a decline with TMF findings, and that is not the case. Um, MHRA and FDA recent inspection findings show that there is actually an increase in the findings, not just at sponsors, but at CROs and at sites as well. And there are four kind of main categories of things that we saw when we looked across um, all of the metrics and the findings. So number one, there's lack of quality control process of the TMF. So QC is very important. QC is something that we talk about a lot. Um, a lot of times, though, I feel like it's just discussed a very, at a very surface level, and we don't get deep into what an actual QC is. And, uh, you know, if you are not performing a QC with cross checks, then you're not really performing a QC. You have to really dig deep into the study because guess what? That's what an inspector or an auditor is going to do. They're going to dig deep into your study. They're going to look at which documents are expected and if those documents are present. Um, next, the TMF table of contents was found to be unreliable. 
And the word unreliable, it's so um, gray to me because that can mean a number of things. That can mean that there was a table of contents and we just, it couldn't be referenced or there was not a table of contents and therefore it couldn't be referenced. Um, but a, t a TMF table of contents, we have to have that now. Um, ICHGCP release two tells us that not only do we have to have a table of contents, but for each and every document in the TMF, we have to list the location as well. So that is very important that if you have a document, you have to list where that document is going to be filed. Um, documents were not consistently held in the TMF. And when we talk about TMF and what a TMF is or is not, um, it, it varies obviously from organization to organization. I was at a the very first TMF conference, if you want to call it that, that the MHRA uh, conducted back in the fall. And one of the things that they said about the TMF and what, how to define a TMF is that it doesn't necessarily have to be one repository. It can be multiple repositories, but you have to be very clear where those documents are being filed. And those other repositories are subject to the same validation, the same QC, um, if required, the inspector, especially within Europe, may require direct access or guided access to that TMF. So very important to, to understand that point. There was evidence that the uploading of the documents was not undertaken in a timely manner. And if I could take that particular bullet point and paste it across my forehead so that everyone could see it, I will do it. Because I this is one of the things that is a, a pain point, I think, for all organizations across the board. It is very difficult to file the documents in a timely manner. But regulations, the FDA, the EMA, ICHGCP release two, they are telling us that documents have to be filed in a contemporaneous manner with the clinical trial. That means that as a milestone happens or as an event occurs, documents associated with that milestone or event need to be filed within the TMF. Waiting until the end of the study to file documents, it's something that we can't do anymore. Um, I remember, and I, I don't know if anyone on the line remembers, working in paper, you may be working in paper now actually, um, working in paper and honestly, it's kind of easy to file a document at any time, right? Because there's no audit trail. But ETMS, they're so sophisticated now, they have audit trails, and guess what? The inspectors and the auditors, they can see the audit trails. So they can see when documents are uploaded. So it's very important to make sure that the TMF is contemporaneous with the clinical trial. So the impact of ETMF on these regulatory trends. So regulatory and compliance topics have given way to ICHGCP Release 2. There is a greater need for oversight. ICHGCP Release 2 specifically calls out oversight and that the sponsor and investigator are responsible for all everything that happens within the clinical trial. Um, the CROs need to be overseen by the sponsors. And this is very important because Sometimes there is a scenario, and I'm sure that we've all worked in it before, where, where CROs are contracting to other CROs. Where's the oversight for that secondary CRO? So it's very important to have a very solid oversight plan in place. Um, and this is true for, again, investigational sites as well. The concerns, and one of the reasons why ICHGCP uh, released to specifically calls out oversight is because of the quality of the information and, and the data that's coming back from the clinical trials, the consistency, differences between CROs, and then transparency, um, ensuring that sponsors have a very good look into everything that is happening with the CROs. And I think it actually works both ways. 
um, because if the sponsor has proper oversight of the CRO, then the CRO is able to perform their services accordingly. So how is the industry responding? Well, that's a very good question, um, and that's something that we're going to look at in just a moment. So ICH GCP released two essential documents. Why should you even care about this? Well, let's look at let's look at what this means, right? Um, so remember the four kind of findings that I talked about earlier. They're all aligned to ICH GCP release two, and what uh, ICH is telling us in regard to essential documents. So that first one the lack of the QC process. Under Section 5 within quality management, ICH is very explicit when they tell us that the sponsor should implement a system to manage quality. Now, what that system is, they don't tell us exactly what that system is, so they do give us some leeway to determine and to develop a system. So it's really up to you, but you should definitely have a system to manage the quality of your TMS. The table of contents issue. So in Section 8, under Essential Documents, it, it, the GCP explicitly says that the sponsor and the investigator, so it's not just the sponsor that has the TMF, right? The TMF also consists of the documents that are at the site as well should maintain a record of the locations of their respective essential documents, including source documents. So this is what I mentioned earlier about documents can be filed in multiple repositories. They can be in different places. Um, probably not too many. You don't want to have <laughs> too many repositories. Um, I do know of a company that had 45 repositories uh, for their TMF. I, I can't imagine being able to manage just all those different places. Um, but ensuring that wherever you file a document, you are documenting where that document is filed. So it's very important. Um, and then remember that, you know, it's 2018. There's a lot happening with technology. So it's not just documents, it's act data as well. So where is the data that's supporting your clinical trial? Where is that information filed? So it's very important to have that documented as well. Documents not consistently held in the TMF. So under Section 8 in ICH DCP Release 2, the storage system used during the trial and for archiving, and regardless of the media use, so again, they, they don't mind different repositories. They don't care. Um, it should provide for the document identification, version history, search, and retrieval. And I hear a lot... Um, from our clients and when I go to conferences and just talking to people about naming conventions and document dates. And I just want to make a, a note here about the search and retrieval aspect of um, this reference here. So document names and document dates help support the searching and the retrieval of documents. So when you're creating your processes and your SOPs, keep that in mind that the reason that you want documents to be named a certain way or you want the dates to be a certain way, it's for this search and retrieval process. Um, because in an inspection, and I'm sure that many of you have experienced this, when you're going and looking for a document, you want to be able to retrieve that, search that for that document and retrieve it very quickly. Um, so think about that when you are, again, creating your SOPs and processes. Um, finally, evidence that the uploading of documents not in a timely manner, under Section 4.9, Records and Reporting, it talks about this, um, as this concept of ALCOA. And I'm sure that many of you have heard of this, and now ICH GCP Release 2 explicitly tells us that the source data has to meet the criteria of being attributable, legible, you have to be able to read it, contemporaneous, contemporaneous. Um, and that point right there kind of says it all. Um, and it's like I mentioned before, 
the documents that are associated with the milestones and the events of the clinical trial, they have to be filed in the TMF in a timely manner. It has to be original, accurate, and complete. And the ALCOA concept kind of applies to all of the inspection findings that we've discussed, the four inspection findings. So it's very important to understand that ICHGCP is now calling this out and we have to comply. So let's take a poll question, another poll question. All right. In your organization, have you fully implemented ICHGCP release two? So I see quite a few people voting. And um, while everyone is voting, I'll just mention the fact that ICHGCP2 is now fully adopted pretty much around the world. Um, there are some Asian countries that have not adopted it yet, but will be in the next couple of months. So it's very important that your SOPs and your processes reflect uh, what is in ICHGCP release two. Okay, so it looks like the majority of respondents have responded. So I'll share the results and I'm not surprised that most of you have not um, implemented R2 yet. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's very important to do it pretty much now <laughs> um, because the inspectors are going to expect that your processes and SOPs are aligned with R2. So it's very important. And kudos to the 24% of you that have implemented R2 within your organization. Um, we're going to talk about um, how to do it in just a moment, but it's very important. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. So R2 has significant revisions. And for those of you that have read through all of R2, you know that, that it does. And now kind of what we're seeing is the interpretation from the different member states on R2. So I think that also is very um, interesting. So for instance, if we look at uh, the EMA guideline that I mentioned earlier, Daniel's gonna talk about, that is their kind of interpretation of what the uh, changes mean and what they expect to see in TMFs for sponsors, um, CROs, and sites that conduct clinical trials within their regions. So certified copy and validation of computerized systems are now fully defined. And you know, if you have an ETMS or if you have a CTMS or an EDC, you're very familiar with the validation process. Well, now ICHGCP release two, they tell us that you have to have your computer system that um, validated, otherwise you can't use it. Um, so it, it's very explicit on that. I think we're gonna see even more information come out from the FDA in terms of what they expect um, in terms of computer validation. So be on the lookout for that. We don't have the exact date. I checked again yesterday just to make sure that I'm giving you all the most recent information, but we don't have the exact date of when the update to um, 21 CFR Part 11 will be finalized. I heard August of this year, but I haven't seen that in writing anywhere. But just to let you know, that is, um, that is coming, and you can't, again, you can't use a computer system if it hasn't been validated. Certified copies, we get this question a lot about what to certify, um, so you have to certify the originals, and have a process in place to certify those copies before you destroy them, um, and that should be part of your document retention policy. Sponsor and principal investigator oversight responsibilities are fully defined. I mean, think about accountability. So ICHGCP, they're telling us that sponsors and investigators, you are responsible for the conduct of the clinical trial. Um, ICHGCP release two also talks about root cause, kappas, and risks. So it's something to consider when you're developing your clinical trial 
um, they add, they tell us to think about the risks up front and try to mitigate mitigate those risks as much as possible. And the TMF is no exception to that. Um, and when you think about risk, the ICHGCP release two also says that the TMF can be reduced if it's appropriate. So if there's a situation where you don't have to collect all of the documents, there may be a um, justification for that, um, but that should be defined at the beginning of the trial. And there's a greater emphasis on quality management. Um, quality management, it, it's not something to overlook, and it's something that is definitely evident within the TMF. How well did you manage the quality of your study? And what does the documentation, does the documentation support that? So when it comes to ICHGCP release two, I would say take action, especially for those of you that have not implemented it yet, take action now. Um, as I mentioned, 90% of the regulatory agencies around the world have fully adopted R2. So here are just kind of some um, steps that you can take right now. So number one, create a TMF standard operating procedure, um, something that reflects G, um, ICHGCP release two. All the principles that are included in R2, make sure that those are reflected in your SOP. Assign a TMF champion. Um, a lot of what's happening right now requires change management. We're going to talk about that. But not just change management, but culture management. And you have to have someone within your organization to lead the charge. So assign a TMF champion. Ensure that your ETMF is completely validated and you have the documentation to prove it. Create a table of contents that includes location of where the documents are filed. File your documents in a timely manner and have that timely manner defined in your SOP. Establish a quality management system. How do you ensure that the quality of your TMF is what you expect it to be? Perform the QC and perform a real QC, not just an inventory of what's uh, present. And then perform proper oversight proper oversight of your vendors, proper oversight of your sites, proper oversight of your CROs, et cetera. So remember ICH's major goal is to do two things. Confirm that patients' rights and safety have been protected and that the data is reliable. Those are the two things that ICH does, and it's very important that your TMF reflects this. So the key to implementation, like I mentioned, it's change management. Um, if your organization has been in paper and doing things the same way for 20 years, it's going to take some change management, some culture management maybe, to get everyone on the same page and to start having them file their documents in 30 days and to have them performing a real QC of their documents and to stop filing their documents on their uh, desktop and really put them into the TMF. So it's going to take someone within your organization to lead the charge and really um, have that true change management. So let's take another poll question, which is gonna lead us into the second half of our presentation. We have implemented and are using an ETMF or e-regulatory binder. So um, 2018, and I think that most companies are using some type of ETMF, but um, there's still a lot of paper out there, so it's, it's, this poll will be interesting. I still see a couple of people voting, so we'll give you guys another couple seconds, and then I'll launch the poll. Okay, close the poll. I'll share the results. Wow, 50-50. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, so 50% are using an ETMF for an e-binder and 50% are not. So that's very interesting. Um, so it, it, it's interesting because let's look at ETMF technology. So right now, it's a very decentralized um, state that we're in. So we have documents coming from all different places. They're, some are paper, some are electronic. Um, if they're electronic and we file our documents paper, then we're printing them and it just, it, it's kind of, it, we're kind of in flux, if you will. 
um, but it's a very decentralized state that we're in. Um, this, these uh, survey results are thanks to Viva. Um, there aren't very many surveys about TMF. Um, I know the TMF reference model is working on the survey uh, for this year. I'm actually on that committee. We haven't launched it yet, but I wanted to give you all the most recent information and to show you how there is a shift from paper to electronic, especially when we look at 2014 versus 2016. You can see in 2014, 13% were using ETMF and now it's up to 24%, but there's still 8% that are using um, paper or some type of local file system. So it's still very interesting, and that's reflective of the survey results. 50% of you are still um, in paper. So ETMF implementation updates. So yes, ETMF implementation is well underway. There is a huge shift right now from paper to digital. Um, there are still some companies that are in paper um, and some companies that enjoy paper um, and may never switch to an ETMF. Um, there's a shift from legacy repositories to more consolidated repositories. And as I mentioned, we're still very decentralized in terms of where our documents are coming from. Uh, the TMF reference model has definitely helped, but how about for the site? Uh, what we hear is, and I know that Daniel can attest to this as well, is that sites don't have a reference model. Um, they're using the NIH reference model or they're using ICH uh, GCP, but there's nothing specifically for them. Um, and that's why I'm really excited about the MAGI ISF reference model um, project. There's still significant progress, but we have a lot of work to do. So there are some challenges that we have. Um, lack of change management, it leads to profound issues, and it doesn't easily address the closed loop challenge. Um, so what is that? That is the exchange of documents from sites to CROs or sites to sponsors and vice versa. So how do we bridge that divide between the two? If the site does not have the exact same reference model as the sponsor, the current workflows attempt to support that communication, but they're really impractical. Um, the ETMF and the EISFs are maintained separately, but there are many interdependencies between them. And I think everyone on the phone, if you're from a sponsor, CRO, or site, you can definitely attest to this. So common challenges to maintaining this relationship between the EISF and ETMF, completeness, and that's what we talked about earlier with ICHGCP release two, contemporaneousness, duplication of documents, document quality, and version control, making sure that each um, repository, so the ETMF or the EISF, always has the most up-to-date information. So some keys to harmonizing the ETMF and EISF, vision to make that happen on a global scale, so looking at the the um, ETMF and EISF all together um, and not working it in a silo. A strategy to frame, shape, and plan, perhaps start in a region and then move up into a more global scale. And then execution, secure leadership buy-in, develop a business case for this, um, review, pro review process and changes, and then explore the different tools that are out there to make that happen. So when we look at the document exchange between sites and CROs, we see that most are using paper um, instead of a, a, por a portal. So let's go to our next poll question and final poll question of the webinar. How are you exchanging documents with your sites or your sponsors? Are you using a custom portal? Are you using ETMF? Are you using snail mail, which hopefully you're not at this point, but many companies are still doing it. Um, are you using email or is there another uh, way that you're exchanging documents with your sites? So we'll give everyone just another couple of seconds and then I'll close the poll. So it's very interesting results. I'll share the results. Most are still using email. 
custom portals are close second. So let's look at that in more detail and what that means. So I'm going to turn it over to Daniel. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sholay. I really appreciate that. And um, basically, uh, currently, uh, we are finding that we need a system to manage the collaboration and exchange between sponsors and sites. Currently, there's a big gap and we need to close this gap or this loop so that both sponsor and site are inspection ready. And with R2 comes more oversight and hence, and the encouragement for systems. The ETMF does not offer an intelligent and automated way to ensure the distribution, collection, and reconciliation of essential document packages between sponsor and sites worldwide, okay? It's predominantly a manual process today. So again, today it's, uh, in most cases, essential document packages are sent uh, to sites normally via a manual process. Emails are, is a, is a, is a uh, file exchanges um, that are not validated, very important. Often CROs are managing this process. There's not much transparency. And there are many cases we're finding where CROs actually outsource to other regional CROs to actually do this work in certain regions. It could be Eastern Europe, it could be Africa, et cetera. And uh, this is problematic, there's, it's inefficient, and there's plenty of risk. There is a lack of transparency, oversight, and consistency with uh, essential document packages in transit. In many cases, CROs provide static reports in PowerPoint as an example. So if you're a sponsor, you've got global trials, you've got essential packages being uh, sent all over the world. Your oversight today is often just a PowerPoint with a CRO telling you often what you wanna hear. Um, so, so the issues here are, uh, there are considerable compliance and uh, quality challenges around version control, completeness, contemporaneousness, duplication, document quality. And again, we need to bring together the ETMF and the EISF. So we'll go to the next slide. So addressing the wild west of study startup essential document reg doc packages. We're closing the, our goal is to close the loop from sponsor to site. We, we need strategy, process, systems, and standards. So today uh, we are, as a, a noble commerce dealing with this, uh, we have a system in place that, that connects the ETMF, provides a study specific EISF, and helps close this loop today. However, the vendors, that, the, the sponsors that we work with, and predominantly in Europe, very large multinational uh, pharmaceutical companies in Europe, you must have the vision, the strategy, and the mission to do this. You must map and model processes to support new technologies and approaches. So again, the premise here is just buying an ETMF is not enough. Uh, implementing te uh, technology. We, we have a specific system called Investigator First. And again, it, it includes a seamless ETMF integration uh, based on the DIA reference model. We can, we can, this tool can work with any ETMF. It automates automated and intelligent essential document exchange. So it's again, we're applying a system approach to that collaboration between the sponsor and the site. And study specific EISF for all sites to facilitate engagement, oversight, compliance, and importantly, consistency. The uh, ETMF, the site ETMF, and the sponsor ETMF must be the same. And we'll go to the next slide to, to address that this in more detail. So recently, the European Medicines Agency uh, guideline on GCP compliance in relation to TMF, content management, archive, audit, and inspection of clinical trials. Very important. Article 57, where many of us are familiar with this, where Clinical trial master file shall at all times contain the essential documents relating to the clinical trial, to that clinical trial, and the quality of the data generated. Now, this is important. The TMF is usually composed of a sponsor TMF held by sponsor organization and an investigator TMF held by the investigator or investigators. The investigator TMF is often referred to as the investigator site file or site master file. The entire TMF for both the for the trial, both 
of the sponsor and of the investigator and institutions should be established at the beginning. And it's important, Europe, uh, author European authorities will look at these different ETMFs as a system, okay? It's very important. It's not just the sponsor, it's also the site. And with R2, sponsors have a, a, a significant vested interest in oversight of CRO and site, okay? The investigator TMF, also known as EISF, may be electronic. And very interestingly, from the European authorities, the system can be provided by a sponsor, a vendor, or by a healthcare institution. So this is very interesting and, and quite bold. Let's go to the next slide. So with that, however, there are some things that the, the uh, agency cautions against. One is a situation where all the investigator site records are sent to the external sponsor for uploading onto an ETMF system, which the investigator then access via a portal. Ultimately could breach data uh, privacy requirements uh, that are not allowed in uh, Europe. Also remote access uh, to investigator documentation at an investigator site from different location by sponsor personnel to uh, personal data of subjects in the investigation investigator TMF, not allowed. What is allowed? Where a portal is used to provide documents to the investigator. If this is not part of the investigator TMF, there needs to be a mechanism to ensure such documentation is filed in the official TMF. Also, additionally, ensure audit trail to demonstrate investigator access to documents in the portal at the appropriate time. So before we go to the next slide, what's very important here and what the European uh, authorities are allowing for and encouraging is that the sponsors can invest in a system to deal with closing the gap, closing the loop between the TMF, the ETMF and the sites. And often CROs are used and, and, and often it's a black box. We don't know how the CROs are, are assembling, packaging, distributing those reg packages or essential doc packages to sites. There are many issues that we have touched upon around completeness, contemporaneousness, duplications, document quality, version controls. This must be now put into a system. If we want true systematic oversight and the next level of compliance and efficiency, very importantly. So we'll go to the next slide. So what we've done is we actually have a system and, and this is an educational uh, webinar. It's meant to really talk about the, the oversight issues with R2, but there are ways to solve this problem. Uh, there, you know, what we've done is we built a product to solve this problem where you have an ETMF on the sponsor side and you have uh, increasingly digital binders on the site side, at least with the larger health, um, site institutions, whether they're academic medical centers or sophisticated sites, they, they, they are investing in electronic uh, regulatory binders. However, we need these, these systems are different. And so uh, when you have an investigator portal technology that has an end-to-end -end essential document exchange system, what we do is we apply rules distribution and workflows, as well as tasks, audit trails, metrics and reports. And what it does systematically is ensure that when the site, the, I'm sorry, the sponsor goes into study start, activation or study startup and, and packages and distributes these essential document packages, it's done in a systematic way to ensure that the site EISF and the, ET, and the ETMF on the sponsor side are harmonized where they need to be so that we can have completeness, we can have the contemporaneousness that's required, where we can have the same documents with the same versions that are required for those inspections. This is a very important topic. It's, 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 it's not understood because many of the ETMF providers don't really address this in a systematic way. So. With that, we'll go to the call to action, Shirley. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. So we're going to sum this up very quickly. Um,
the call to action from Daniel and myself, what we see as the next steps are for everyone on the phone to establish change management first, very important as we discussed today. Understand ICH release two, the new oversight requirements for sponsor zeros and sites. Learn about the strateg strategies and approaches with us, with LMK, um, and then study the established systems on the market, such as Investigator First from Innovo Commerce. It's an excellent system. And get involved with standards groups, such as the MAGI site reference model. So with that, we're going to open it up for questions, and we do have some time for questions, and I see that we do have some questions. Um, okay, so the first question is, and again, just as a reminder, to ask a question, you can type it into the question pane um, within GoToWebinar. So the first question is, why is there a restriction to sponsor personnel remotely accessing personal data of subjects? What is considered personal data? So. Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, so what is considered personal data? So GDPR, and we're not going to get too far down into this um, today, but GDPR lists what personal data is and is not. Um, and each country, in addition to GDPR, each country typically has a list of what they consider personal data. So um, I would encourage each of you to understand the countries that you're working in as it relates to GDPR and what is or what is not considered personal data. For instance, um, data birth can be considered personal data in one country but not in the other. Always err on the side of uh, being very conservative with that. Um, is there any recommendation from regulatory authorities about documents staying in some other non-validated system and copy to ETMF, which is validated. So if I understand this question correctly, um, all of your documents have to be, if, it, if they're in an electronic repository, that electronic repository needs to be validated. So if you are copying them in from a non-validated system into a validated system, that's perfectly fine. Follow your document retention uh, policies and procedures when doing so, and make sure that you have a certified copy process in place for those documents that are original. Okay, the next question is, do you keep, a par keep in parallel a paper TMF for original wet signature in case of documents not electronically signed? That is a very good question, and it depends on the region because there are some countries that require you to maintain um, original wet inked documents. So um, it's difficult to just give that kind of a blanket um, answer because it depends on the document retention policies within the countries that you're working in. So um, I, it depends on the document, number one, and it depends on the country. So um, it's hard to answer that <laughs> with a blanket, but it depends. So make sure that you are following uh, the document retention within your country. Well, um, those are all the questions, and we have one more minute left. Um, so on behalf of LMK, thank you very much for joining. And our contact information is here and it's also on the slides. And I'll turn it to Daniel to close us out. Uh, I want to thank everybody for taking the time uh, to participate in this webinar. Uh, we think it's a, a very important topic. The, uh, as Shole had mentioned in the beginning, the regulations are changing. It's a very dynamic and uh, uh, unfolding situation. It's important to keep abreast of the different rules from GDPR to the EMEA to uh, FDA and um, ensure that you have a vision, strategy, process change, and the right systems to make sure that you're uh, having the oversight that is required.
Thank you very much.